I have been fascinated by African pottery for four decades. I first went to West Africa as a young Peace Corps volunteer assigned to the National Arts Center in Ouagadougou to organize their pottery section. I immediately discovered that the potters in Burkina Faso were already extremely skilled, and so I devoted my effort to learning how they make pottery invi and inviting them to come to the Arts Center to work and demonstrate their skills for visiting tourists. As an art historian, I also discovered that across the continent, African potters create an enormous range of shapes and sizes, textures and patterns, and sorts of colors of pottery. They quickly fashion closed containers for storing water or grain, more open containers for cooking, small containers for holding palm wine or millet beer, large containers that never are moved, that are used to store the family's harvest, some of these jars are heavily decorated with modeled shapes and patterns and then used as shrine pots for religious celebrations. Others become darkened with decades of soot as they sit on the open hearths in women's kitchens. African potters understand as fully as Western potters do the almost magical plastic quality of clay and that can be prodded, pushed, squeezed, molded, twisted, and pulled into unlimited shapes. To make pottery, you have to have good clay. All across Africa, potters know where there are good veins of uniform clay that is free from foreign materials. Sometimes the women themselves go out to collect the clay, but often they send their children with baskets. They must be very careful when digging the clay not to dig back so far into the bank that the heavy earth on the surface collapses on top of them. They carry the heavy clay back to the workshop where they may let it dry. Hey, took it. A slide. Sometimes if the holes are so big that they cannot sustain their weight, the weight of the overburden, they collapse, and sometimes the potters put their lives at risk. In some areas, the clay is, is filled with water and allowed to soak, absorbing as much water as possible in a process called slaking. They break the clay up into small chunks and place it in a mortar, and then pound it with a pestle to turn it into powder. They then sift the clay powder with the same sort of sieve that is used for preparing food. In another area of the compound, potters or their children may be smashing up old broken potsherds between two stones to produce a grainy material which is called grog. This is clay that has already been fired once, and so when it is fired again it will not shrink. The grog is added to the powdered clay and both are then kneaded together with water to produce the clay body that can be used for making pottery. Here you see one of the daughters of the family whose job it is to knead the clay by foot. She systematically circles kneading the clay and then adds new fresh powder and kneads again. <laughs> 
to her fresh clay by hand. Among the Igbo peoples of southern Nigeria, the clay may be placed in a shallow trough and kneaded into a uniform mass using a pestle. The simplest and most obvious technique is simply to turn an old jar upside down on the ground and to use it as a mold for a new jar. Mrs. Konate in the village of Uri in central Burkina Faso has been making jars for decades. I first photographed her in 1983 and I've been going back to visit her from time to time ever since. The last time I visited her in 2010 she was getting very elderly and frail. She begins by forming a flat pancake of fresh clay and then she slaps it down over the mold jar. She uses a beater in her right hand to spread the fresh clay out over the mold jar, thinning it and spreading it. Mrs. Konate is the wife of a blacksmith, and you can hear the blacksmiths at work behind her. She uses a coil of fresh clay to form a ridge around the base and then shapes that with her fingers into a flat bottom that will support the pot when it is placed on the ground. When it is the right thickness and has covered the jar to its widest dimension, she carefully trims the lower edge to make it uniform and sets it aside to dry for a short period. She must be careful not to leave it for too long or it will cr begin to crack as it shrinks on the mold jar. When it is stiff enough so that it won't deform, she lifts it off, sometimes with the help of another woman in the compound. The concave mold technique is the first technique that I discovered when I first went to Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. I had studied pottery in college, but I had never seen such an unusual and innovative technique. The potter has a shallow depression, or sometimes more than one, in the floor of her workshop, or even in the space she uses a kitchen, so that she can go from work to cooking after washing her hands. The depression is only about an eighth of a sphere deep, yet she is able to use it to form a fully spherical jar. She kneads fresh clay into a thick round mass and places it in the mold. She then uses a mallet in her right hand to pound the fresh clay into the mold, thinning it and spreading it. 
Of course, she quickly fills up the shallow mold, and so she rotates the mass of fresh clay up on edge, exposing part of the shallow mold, and con continues to pound. She rotates and pounds, rotates and pounds, building the spherical jar larger and larger. From time to time, she stops and uses her fingers to consolidate the rough clay around the edge of the opening. Occ occasionally, when she discovers she has ran out of fresh clay, she adds a fresh coil around the rim and continues to pound and rotate. The technique produces a very thin, light, strong spherical jar. She sets it upright in the mold and uses a coil of fresh clay around the opening to form the rim. <laughs> 
at this point, the jar is almost complete and she is adding the coils to form the rim. She carefully consolidates the rim and then uses a wet cloth to smooth it. Like all American and European potters, I picked up African jars and tapped them with my fingers to see if they were fired to the right temperature. Of course, they made a thump instead of a ring because they were low-fired earthenware. I thought it would be nice to teach them how to fire their pottery to a higher temperature. Then I discovered that they didn't want high-fired pottery because the low-fired earthenware they made could be used for cooking over an open fire, while higher-fired pottery would shatter if exposed to open flame. It soon became apparent to me that the techniques that African potters use represent appropriate technology. That is, Africans had developed techniques to make pottery that suited their needs, but whose manufacture did not consume precious or expensive resources. The variations on African pottery shapes, colors, and decoration are almost infinite. In this example from the Nyakusa people in Tanzania, we see large hemispheres of bright red against a cream-colored slip. The sharp joint around the middle portion of the pot makes it appear as if it had been formed in two separate pieces. This pot from the Zande people in northern Congo certainly looks a little bit phallic, and it has wonderful ridges of plastic modeling. This beautiful jar from the Baule people has a rough texture around the lower portion and bands of lizards and snakes below the rim. The Zulu are famous for their elegant black beer jars, which may have incised or impressed patterns or large brazed dots, which the Zulu call amasumpa, or warts. The Tutsi people make very elegant, delicate pots, which must be used for holding palm wine. I love the contrast in color between the darker neck and the lighter body of the jar. This jar from the Nyanja people in Malawi is similar to the Tutsi jar, except it has a broader neck on a low round body. The Bamaleke people in Cameroon are famous for their large round jars. This beautiful example has two strings of stylized human figures around the shoulder of the jar. The elegant flaring rim has been modeled by hand, not turned on a potter's wheel. The Mambila live along the Benue River in Nigeria and produce large, powerful jars like this one with three handles. Large bumps that look like Zulu warts are modeled into a human figure. The upper portion of this Nupe jar is decorated with very stylized human figures that have been scraped into the surface with a narrow comb. This Nupe jar with one chamber above the other was probably used as a filter. This small jar from Nigeria has been covered with human and animal shapes. It was almost certainly a shrine pot. Lobi women in Burkina Faso make beautiful large round jars which they stack one above the other in their kitchens to hold supplies, food, and even valuables. Here is in many of the jars the dark color is the result of reduction firing with extra fuel introduced to turn the red iron oxide to black iron oxide. This broad jar from Malawi is decorated with patterns of parallel and sized lines. The surface of this Ebo jar has been roughened by using a roulette that is rolled over the surface in the palm of the potter's hand. This jar has been decorated in the same way, but the potter has brilliantly left a few areas unroughened. A beautiful large Edoma jar from just north of the Benue River. Another from the same people with irregular bands of decoration. I personally much prefer this evidence that the jar was actually made by a human hand rather than being decorated with some sort of a mechanical device, as so often happens in the Western world. You see the same use of irregular patterns on this jar from southern Burkina Faso. An amazing jar from the Mama people, with three enormous lobes, 
I would be fascinated to know what such an object was used for. An Ebo jar with fine lines of raised decoration. This jar from Cameroon has been reinforced with basketry applied over the exterior. Many shrine jars have added figures in relief, but the depth of the relief on this Mambila jar is exceptional. And another from the Mambila in Cameroon with very large warts and the human figure. The Bamana people of Mali are masters at producing large round jars for storage. A jar from Nigeria with what appears to be scarification patterns on the abdomen and either an umbilicus or genitalia. The same patterns are more easily visible on this larger jar. Almost certainly a palm wine jar from southern Nigeria. Many of the people along the Benue River produce ancestor pots to be placed on shrines. This jug from the lower Congo may be modeled after a European liquor jug. Another similar jug but with brilliant addition of two human heads. The Songhe people of central Congo are famous for jars like this one with two swelling areas, one just below the rim at the shoulder and another on the belly of the pot. A small jar for palm wine with a beautifully modeled human head. A very simple but elegant jar from northeastern Congo. A small dish for serving food with a human head and faces. This large jar from the Bamana people has two very different textures, a glossy upper portion and a much more matte lower portion decorated with serpents. This beautiful Zulu beer pot shows the raised warts which they call Amasumpa. This is a figurative ancestor pot and another from the Mambila people. I think this is the first jar from the Makonde people that I've ever seen, and I'm very impressed by the quality of the decoration. East African potters seem to, seem to be much more focused on s perfect symmetry than potters in West Africa, even without the use of a potter's wheel. Sometimes the black color is caused by years of accumulation of soot, but more often from conscious blackening in a reduction firing. The rough warts on this beer pot must have been must have made it much easier to handle it when it was wet. A nupe container with two breasts and an umbilicus. People all along the Niger River in Mali and Niger produce large, very colorful jars. This one has a lovely f dark fire cloud caused by reduction during the firing. This Eve shrine pot from Togo is decorated with all sorts of signs and symbols from the coastal religion called Vodou. Finally, a lover, lovely jar from Nigeria with a beautiful dark fire cloud produced during the firing. One of the most common and ubiquitous techniques in West Africa is the coiling technique. Some people in Africa use the toiling, coiling technique exclusively, while other potters use it to add new material to pottery they have started to form using other techniques. First, Mrs. Konate in the village of Uri scrapes the edge of the jar with a sharp tool to remove dry material so that the fresh clay will adhere better to it. She then forms a large, thick sausage of clay and holding it in her right hand inside the pot, applies it against the heel of her left hand, which is outside the pot. As she applies the clay, she gives the sausage a twist with her wrist, which consolidates the fresh clay into the rising walls of the jar below. Ebo potters who make small jars in Nigeria use smaller, lighter sausages of clay, while Bwa potters in the village of Uri use very large, thick sausages of clay consuming several sausages as they make a complete revolution around the jar. Now she is adding a coil to the exterior, thickening the rim so that she can form it into a large, symmetrical, solid rim 
jar is way too large to rotate it, and so instead she walks around the jar herself. I am sure there are potters in Nigeria who form enormous jars to be used for soaking cassava or brewing some kind of beer. These Igbo potters in southern Nigeria are forming smaller jars using the coiling technique. Because the pots are small, the potters can hold the base in their hand while they use coils to increase the dimensions of the new jar. Here she scrapes clay from the base up to form the walls of the new jar. She has thinned the base out and now she's adding a new coil of fresh clay. Now she has formed almost half of a sphere. These artists are extremely deft, able simply to press the fresh clay with their right hand into the heel of the left hand, consolidating it with the edge of the jar and rapidly building up a partial sphere. Once the basic shape of the jar has been completed, the potter uses coils to add more material, building the walls of the jar up higher and higher and scraping them with a shell to spread and thin them. She scrapes the sides of the jar upward with a wooden tool. She is working on the inside of the jar with the knuckles of her right hand, and so she supports the walls of the jar on the outside with her left hand. Finally, she adds another coil around the edge of the rim, which she can then shape into a flange, and then decorate with impressed patterns. <laughs> <laughs> 
smooths the interior of the jar with a shell. She smooths the rim out with a wet cloth to make it nice and smooth and uniform. Now she begins to impress small delicate patterns on the flared rim. 
Here she is using a twisted piece of string as a roulette to roll across the surface of the pot to give it a rough texture, which makes it easier to handle. This is a jar for smoking fish. Until I met Maria Cafando in 2001, I thought I had seen all of the variations of pottery making available in Burkina Faso. Maria is an elderly lady who Welcome. lives in a small village about 50 miles south of Ouagadougou. She has been making pottery all of her life and supports her daughters and her grandchildren with the income from her pottery. She begins, of course, by kneading the clay and then uses the convex mold technique to form a half of a sphere. She forms several of these small, thick hemispheres and then takes them into her house where she places a spherical mold inside each one. She uses a mallet in her right hand to thin the clay out and spread it over the mold, but she does not stop when she reaches the widest part of the mold. Instead, she continues to spread and thin the clay until she has almost completely covered the mold jar. At this point, her technique becomes truly interesting because she performs four small episiotomies around the edge of the new jar and removes the mold from the interior. She folds the edges of the incisions on top of each other and then inserts a smaller mold inside the new jar and begins to tap again, repairing the tears. <laughs> 
works with a small clay form, which I call an anvil, on the inside of the jar and taps gently on the outside of the jar with her right hand holding a concave mallet or hammer. As she does so, the jar becomes thinner and thinner, but retains its very symmetrical spherical shape. She carefully trims around the rim of the jar to even it out. Maria then adds a thick sausage of fresh clay around the rim, working it into the spherical jar with her thumb and forefinger. Finally, she uses a wet piece of cloth to shape the rim, to thin it and flare it while she rotates the new jar in her left hand. She does all of this while holding the jar in her lap and without placing it on the ground or on any kind of support. The next day, when the jar has dried sufficiently, she takes it out into a courtyard and fills in any low spots or blemishes with fresh clay and rubs the entire jar smooth with a necklace of strong baobab seeds. Two years after I made this video, Maria traveled with my PhD student, Dr. Barema Jamatani, to the city of Taipei, in China, where she gave demonstrations of her pottery technique to a congress of potters, artists, and anthropologists. At the end of the trip, she was quite exhausted and happy to return home. A woman who had barely left her village before traveled all the way to China and back on Air France 
and stayed in a luxury hotel. I met the artist Awa Diabate in the village of Pelignan in southwest Burkina Faso in 2001. She is a member of a group of artists called Jelly, whose husbands are leather workers. There were several related men in this village, along with a large number of wives, all of whom were skilled potters. Awa begins with a large mass of clay, which she places on a shallow dish between her knees. She forces her fist down into the mass of clay, forming a cavity and then using the fingers of her right hand inside the jar and her left hand outside the jar, begins to pull the soft wet clay upward, thinning it and increasing the height of the jar. She rotates the jar on a shallow dish while she remains seated. When she has increased the height as much as she can with the material with which she started, she adds more clay by using a fresh coil. She adds a coil to the rim and rotates it to smooth it and make it uniform. As she forms the rim, she rotates the pot as if it were on a potter's wheel. But in fact, because there is no axis on which to rotate, this is not a true wheel. She turns the jar upside down and using a sharp ring of raffia midrib, she scrapes away excess clay, thinning the clay body. <laughs> Finally, she applies a rough but uniform texture to the exterior of the jar with a corn cob roulette. Asante potters use the very same te technique as the potters in western Burkina Faso, with the major exception that they form the top half of the pot completely before they turn it upside down and finish the pot from the bottom upwards. On this rainy day in Kumasi, I only had time to video the first half of pottery production, which was the forming of the upper half of the jar. Had I been able to stay and had it not been raining, I would have filmed her completing the pot upside down. <laughs> 
ना वो ही वो ऐसे ऐसे कुछ भी ये मुंह पाई कुछ भी मामा दिया she scoops out the mass of clay at the center of the new jar and forces her fist down inside. Now she pulls the clay from the inside of the jar with her right hand, upward to form the upper walls of the jar. She uses a very large, thick coil of clay to add more material to the jar. You can hear the rain on the plastic that covers my camera. You can see her daughters and nieces in the background kneading the clay that she needs to make another pot. She uses a dried corn cob to smooth the exterior of the jar into a uniform surface. African potters fire in the open. With the exception of modern potters who have been taught Western techniques by visiting technicians from Europe or America, African potters do not use kilns, but either fire on the flat ground or in a very shallow depression. Occasionally potters will construct low circular walls in which they place their pottery, and the walls keep extra cold air from blowing into the firing. 
potters use whatever fuel is available. They may use dry donkey manure, dry grass from the fields beyond their homes, dry bark that they collected while they were cutting firewood, or especially in the forest areas to the south, the dried midribs of raffia palms. They never use expensive fuels such as gas or electricity. All of the women in the community work together to pile up the new pottery in the kiln for a firing. If several women work together, each may identify her own pottery by some pattern impressed in the clay or painted with slip on the exterior. In some cases, they all work together to fire the pottery of just one of the women. In this case, they are all working to fire the pots created by Awa Tiabate. Awa <laughs> Diabate is wearing a green and white checked skirt. The fuel is lighted and allowed to burn freely. In Pelignan, you see some of the women throwing pails of water on the firing to try to slow down the burning so that it doesn't get too hot too rapidly. They also take care not to let the fire spread to the neighboring brush. In a short time the fuel has been reduced to a very thick blanket of red hot ash. The pottery bakes underneath this for some time until it is a bright glowing red. While it is still hot, the potters hook out the pottery and dip the hot pottery in a kind of vegetable soup made of boiled up acacia seed pods. This process drives excess carbon deep into the body of the hot pottery, turning the jars from a bright red to a dark brown. This is very similar to techniques used in Japan and America, which are called raku. The process makes the pottery more suitable for cooking over an open fire, and makes jars more waterproof. The process turns the red ferric iron, Fe3, into black ferrous iron, Fe2. This is the firing of Ibo pottery in Ishiagi village, Ibonyi state, south of Enugu in Nigeria. The firing has been completed and the potters are removing the red hot pottery. Here the women of the Bamago family in Dablo are firing all of their pottery together. Mrs. Bamago poses with her pots. <laughs> 
all African artists are extraordinarily creative. The women who make pottery in Africa are among the best. Look at any catalog of African pottery for sale in Chicago or New York or San Francisco and just imagine the margin between the prices asked and the income of the potter who made it. Scholars say that Africans don't have a word for art. I say Westerners don't have a word for art. What is art? Westerners say art is something that's never used. Art for art's sake. What sort of art is never used? All art is used. African art is heavily used. My definition of art is something that is used to express people's ideas about the world they live in. In my mind, this means Africans are the only people who understand art, and that we, the Westerners, are the only people who don't have a word for art.